Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, outer space. Space. Space, space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. My Rifle, written by DeRay Leaf. It's cold, and the wind bites my cheeks, threatening to freeze the tears leaking from my eyes. But I don't care. My eyes keep peering down the sight of my ancient rifle, swathed in cloth to protect its aging parts from the howling wind and the snow that drapes around me like a funeral shroud. This is my rifle. There are many like it, but this one is mine. I remember my mother leaning over me as I disassembled the spirit rifle over and over, till I got it all right. Her lesson ingrained into me so very deeply. The rifle has many parts, and jumbled up like this, the task can be daunting. But just pick one, make it shiny, then take another and see how they have fit. Step by step, you build it back. She's gone now. So is our homestead, and the nearby town, and the big city over the hill. My rifle is my best friend. It is my life. I must master it, as I must master my life. They came from the stars, enemies in a war we didn't care about. We're just a small colony far away from everything, just the way the folks here liked it. But the invaders didn't care. Movement catches my eye, and I focus on the gangly animal that steps onto the road down below. Even though it is nearly a kilometer away, the animal stops in the middle of the hardened road as my crosshair sweeps across it. It looks up, and I swear it looks right in my eyes down the scope. But I don't fire. I'm not hunting it just yet. My rifle without me is useless. A sound makes the animal bolt and headlights pierce the gloom that is prevalent nowadays. The rocks they use to flatten the cities and towns kicked up so much dust that I haven't seen a binary sun in months. But it was their mistake. The cloud cover means their ships in orbit can't provide support. Storms, like the brewing snowstorm, meant that the air support was grounded most days too. Hence, their reliance on old-fashioned ground-based transport. Without my rifle, I am useless. Transport, like the four ground cars that trundled into view around the bend. They look almost comical, wide and rounded to accommodate the inhuman invaders almost like a child's toy. Seeing the comically rounded toy cars parked outside of a burned-down homestead made the appearance a lot less endearing, though. My scope sweeps across the windshield of the first vehicle. Snowflakes splatter the glass, and my chapped lips curl painfully as I see the little detail. No shields on this one. The crosshairs fall on the driver, the fur on the alien still soggy from having been in the weather a short while ago. And the way they pant with their maw open tells me that they're either anxious about driving in this weather or drunk. I don't really care. I must fire my rifle true. I must shoot straighter than my enemy who is trying to kill me. A quick sweep over the small convoy confirms they are all driving without shields. The three training vehicles stuck close to the lead one, a little too close even. New transfers, most likely. Good. I return my sights to the first driver. My breath warms my lips as I exhale slowly, as Mama taught me. Time stops. I will shoot him before she shoots me. I will. The kick against my shoulder is welcome. Below in the valley, the windshield of the squat invader ground car cracks into a spider web, and the compartment is splattered with what was the head of the driver a split second ago. The car loses control instantly and swerves, but it can't swerve far as a sudden drop in speed surprises the driver behind it. The second ground car slams into the back of the first one, but I only see this in passing. My sights sweep back over the third car that avoids hitting the second, but then gets thrown forward as the fourth car slams into it. The driver of the fourth car is shouting something to the alien riding shotgun as my second round of the night ends all of his troubles. His comrade opens his maw wide in shock as the driver's head explodes, but this shock is short-lived as my third round finds his throat. 
my rifle and I. No, that what counts in this war is not the rounds we fire, the noise of our burst, nor the smoke we make. We know that it's the hits that count. We will hit. Invaders swarm out of the vehicles as I swivel my rifle back across. One of them seemed to know what to do, roaring commands and pointing out a good cover for his soldiers. His thoughts of command end as my fourth shot takes his leg off at the hip. The roar of sheer agony the shot produces echoes even up to my little perch, and again my chapped lips twitch with a cruel little smile. One of his soldiers rushes up and the medkit clutched in his paw like a football. I remember playing football with my siblings. They went to the big city to sell produce on the day that the sky caught fire. The alien medic joins his commander in agonizing screams as my fifth shot shatters the medkit in the arm that was clutching it into bloody ruin. My rifle is human, even as I am, because it is my life. Thus, I will learn it as a sibling. I will learn its weaknesses, its strength, its parts, its accessories, its sights, and its barrel. My thoughts go empty as I fire the next five rounds in the magazine. Aliens fall, screaming for their comrades with ruined limbs and clutching wounds in places that are not immediately fatal. The screams and the roars of pain unnerve those that remain and... As I slide to the next heavy box magazine home, some down below lose their nerve completely. The route begins as troopers either wildly fire at random directions with their own rifles, or just throw down their weapons and run. The runners die first. I will keep my rifle clean and ready, even as I am clean and ready. We will become part of each other. We will. My mind goes blank as I fall into a rhythm. My crosshair sweeping across the back of a running invader and my fingers squeezing just enough to make my rifle bark out my displeasure with a soldier that would abandon his rifle. That would abandon his comrades. These soldiers didn't kill my family. They didn't even kill my friends or the colony I grew up in. They're new recruits sent here by the Imperial leaders to secure the peace. They failed. And for their failure... They die. Before the gods, I swear this creed, my rifle and I are defenders of my family. We are the masters of our enemy. We are the takers of lives. They took the planet in less than a week. Powerful ships wiped out the paltry local garrison within hours, then took their time-flattening cities, towns, and finally targeting individual homesteads. But they miscalculated. It takes a certain kind of human to go settle on a godforsaken frontier planet like this one. The kind of folks that need the peace after a long life of service. The kinds that have bags packed and rifles ready to go at a mere hint of trouble. The kind of folks that know their hills and forests like the back of their hands. So be it, until victory is mine and there is no enemy but peace. My rifle clicks empty on the fourth magazine of the day. Below, the screams of the dying and the wounded echo over the snow-covered hills. Far off in the distance to my east, a dull boom reverberates, and my lips curl painfully yet again. It seems the Jameson boys, with their fancy man pads, got lucky after all. The wounded down there won't be getting a cassavac from the local airbase just yet. So be it then. I get up and shake the snow off the thermal blanket that I am wearing as a cape. My trusty rifle is up and ready as I head off after the herbivore I saw earlier. The camps in the hills can always need more protein, after all. End of story. Story number two. Leave, written by Speedhump23. The security droid looked at the wall. The strange text was painted in bright floral yellow and covered most of the wall. Photographing the text, the droid applied a spray of grey paint to the wall to cover the text and move on. Minutes after the droid left, the grey paint bubble then broke apart above the letters. Then the text was visible again. According to the local teacher, grabbed from their home in the morning to translate, the strange text meant leave in a local dialect. 
the occupying force commander looked at the photos of vandalism. This word was appearing all over the city. It had started a few days after the city council had surrendered and then been executed for crimes against the people. The new protectors of the city, and almost all of the planet, had moved in to help put down any troublemakers and restore peace. The security droids they had brought with them had been enforcing the curfew by shooting anyone after the sun's down each night. But these words were still turning up. What was worse, the standard paint applied to cover them up, to stop the public seeing them, was not working. A second-tier officer had the idea of sticking a board over one of the more prominent texts, and for good measure, had plastered a photo of the logo of the liberating force of almost all the planets so far on the board. The next day, the board had leave painted over the logo, and once again, the text refused to be covered by paint. The commander now started to deploy more droids and troops to cover up the script every day, and the search for the terrorists each night. To no avail. There were not enough troops to patrol the entire city, and new examples kept popping up each morning. High Command was worried. The population could see the sign of resistance to their benevolent rule, and this could not be tolerated. Executions of artists and paint sellers were suggested, but this would play into the hands of the terrorist calligrapher. Analysis of the paint was proving difficult. It was almost as if the paint could tell when it was covered over and burnt its way through the covering paint. Marianne. A third-tier scientist had noticed that the script for the word was identical each time, obviously, meaning the script was being written by the same person. The text was very clean and precise, so obviously an elder person must be involved, as only someone with great learning and years of practice could produce such a consistently clean script. The security forces were putting more and more resources and troops to the capital to find the terrorist calligrapher. Now they had started to detain all teachers and scientists, and force them to write word on a wall to make sure that it did not match the terrorist text. Unfortunately, the technicians designated to paint over the example text soon found that the dreaded word had been painted over the top of the following morning. The first security skimmer to be seen with the word leave on it was found in a vehicle pool the next day. The text covered the entire front of the vehicle, and no paint would stay in place to hide it. The vehicle was ordered broken down for parts before any locals could see it. The next day, a dozen armored skimmers and a flyer were decommissioned for the same reason. But Bright Spark, late from the motor pool, had thought of applying heat from a fuser to the paint to see if they could burn it off. The paint caught fire with the heat that etched the metal of the armored skimmer, burning off most of the paint and plexiglass, rendering the vehicle wrecked, but still showing the text on the charred remains of the hull. More resources needed to be focused on the city to catch this terrorist, otherwise the population might rise up and rebel. More skimmers were need to be pulled from the front line. The pesky resistance could still be crushed. Four weeks later, the invaders evacuated to their drop craft, many with leave inscribed on the sides of their craft, or on the armored skimmers hurriedly being loaded onto them. The human ambassador of the neutral Terran Federation smiled. The humans had stayed in their compound for the four months the invasion had been taking place. The rules of conquest were strict here, and unless the government asked for aid, it could not be offered. And this government had been rather stupid in thinking aid would not come, or would come at too high a price, so had not asked for it. Not to say that the ambassador had not done something... So, Chief, uh, the nanobots are all back in storage? Yes, ma'am, uh, all counted and cleaned. I would not have thought that this would have worked as well as it did. The PsyOps chaps did a good job with the original idea, but I would love to find out who told the stupid invaders that the symbol meant leave. That was a stroke of genius. Kilroy would have been proud. Yes, originally the plan was just to confuse and demoralize them, but the... Leave attribution capped off the whole thing rather nicely. One thing I am wondering about when those dropships heat up the next time they enter an atmosphere, what will happen? 
the ambassador smiled. Oh, uh, nothing good for the idiots on board, I can assure you. End of chapter. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian.